like shine light on the critical challenges and opportunities facing the Shundarvans Delta, a region of profound ecological significance and immense vulnerability to the impact of climate change. The Shundarvans Delta symbolizes the dedicated harmony between human society and the environment. With the acceleration of climate change, the region encounters significant challenges prompting us to explore strategies for building resilient livelihoods in depth. As we confront the realities of climate change, the Shundarbans Delta emerges as a frontline battleground, a place where the force of nature and human interventions interact with profound consequences, rising sea level, changing weather pattern and anthropogenic activities threaten the very fabric of life in the region, changing the resilience of its inhabitants and ecosystem alike. At the core of our discussion today is the idea of resilience, a concept that represents adaptation and strength the, in tough time. So through our session, we aim to explore the complexities to ensure a resilient livelihood in the Shundarban Delta, looking uh, at how climate change impacts and governance are evolving. Effective governance emerges as a cornerstone in navigating the complexities of climate change, adaptation, and resilient livelihood by fostering inclusive uh, decision-making process um, and empowering local communities, governance structures play a vital role uh, in shaping adaptive uh, strategies and bolstering like resilient livelihoods in the face uh, of uncertainty. Throughout our session, we will delve into critical themes such as substance um, livelihoods, the impact of human activities and the ongoing situation in the transboundary Sundarbans region. Drawing from detailed case study and real world experience, we aim to illuminate pathways towards a future where Delta communities can build resilient livelihoods. This future is characterized by uh, innovation, collaboration, and collective action. So as we embark on our like this journey, I encourage active participation and the sharing of insights. Now, let me introduce our estimate um, speakers. So first, there will be two case study sharing um, one by um, Nurul Islam Biplop, a lead researcher at Sajida Foundation, and he will like present a case study on resilient livelihoods in the Shundarban Delta. Then our second speaker, who is um, Shorodi Pathak, uh, he is a researcher at IIT Kharagpur, uh, we'll delve into like governance influences for building resilient communities in the region. And then we are honored to have two experts with us who are joining us um, as key discussant. So one is uh, Dr. Samia A. Selim, uh, Climate Advisor at Sajida Foundation and Director of the Center for Sustainable Development at ECAP. Uh, sorry, you left will share insights on governance role in climate change adaptation. And then um, we have like Emily Kremin with us. Uh, she is project coordinator and researcher at the University of Lausanne. And she will discuss the climate change impacts on livelihoods in the Shundarbans Delta. So please join me in welcoming our estimated speakers whose expertise will enrich our discussion today. Now I would like to uh, give the floor uh, to Samia for first as uh, she is here to welcome everyone. Yes, Aha. Okay, thank oh, you, yeah. Mahmuda. Uh, hello, everyone. Good uh, afternoon here. <laughs> good morning, good evening, wherever you're joining from. Um, so yeah, as, as uh, Mahmuda mentioned, our session today is very much focused on uh, a collaborative uh, project that we're involved in from different institutes from three different 
countries um, engage project and uh, we'll, you know you'll hear more about it um, throughout the, the this panel today um, the the this the, the the really what we wanted to understand you know there's a lot of work around climate resilience around governance but what we wanted to uh, really um, focus on is a very much participatory process led bottom up a deeper understanding, not just of what's happening now, but what has led to where we are now and uh, to, to understand, you know, different aspects of uh, resilience, local adaptation, how governance plays a role, a role and, and other things that have come up from, from the work that we're doing. Um, again, our work is based uh, on the in, in India side on Komimari, and you'll hear about that from Shoradeep and then from the Bangladesh side in Ashashuni, both uh, focus on transboundary issues in the Shundarbon Delta. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's an ongoing work, you know, we have uh, just at the beginning stages, but there's some key, key elements that we have found so far that we really wanted to first present to you. And then we'd want to spend some time uh, in, in having rich discussions on, you know, how do you connect these dots? What can we learn from here, you know, that we can um, possibly, you know, share turn into knowledge products, inform policy, and have deeper impacts on understanding of all, or not all things on certain aspects of resilience, uh, adaptation, sustainability, and governance. Uh, so on that note, I will uh, stop here, Mahmuda, and then pass it back to you. Thank you, Appa. So now I would like to give the floor to Biplav Bhai to share the case study from Bangladesh Nirvana site. Okay, uh, thank you, Mahmuda. Just uh, checking, uh, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Just give me a thumbs up or... Yes, perfect. Uh, great. Um, I'm sharing my screen, so I will not be able to see you, but uh, okay. Um, thank you, uh, Mahmuda, and thank you, uh, Governor Platform, to giving us the opportunity to present our findings, but this is very preliminary findings, and also you could see from the titles um the, the 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 findings we'd like to share today is more focus on local government's role at the very uh, uh bottom level the how local government uh, is playing a very significant role that actually uh influencing and impacting uh, the livelihoods of the people who are dealing um climate change um dealing uh, human interventions dealing uh, multiple disasters, all sort of uh, issues. So the focus would be more on local government's role in managing livelihoods at the local level. But the, before uh, I go uh, to the findings or the cases we have found, I'd like to give you a very brief background of our larger research project um, that our uh, uh, transdisciplinary, transboundary research project uh, a three years research project, there are multiple partners involved. Uh, we here at Bangladesh, we have two partners, Sajida Foundation and University of Liberal Arts Bangladesh. From India, we have also two partners, IIT Karakpur and um, another organization from Indian Sundarbans. We also have um, University of Luzon as our partner. This whole project is um, funded by uh, Swiss uh, National Science Foundation. So this is a three years project. Uh, so the, the, the reason we are calling it a transdisciplinary research project because uh, this is very, uh, this is not something that we as a researcher design. The, the, the research, the whole project was designed uh, with active collaboration from the community. So it's a co-designed uh, approach. The knowledge we are producing is also a co-production of knowledge uh, between uh, academic, non-academic researcher uh, and communities. And the, the, the methods we are applying, uh, we are calling it more like a historical ethnographic methods that also has a, a experimentation uh, design. So the research findings will contribute to the design of um, experimentations. And obviously this is a transboundary research setting because we have two different uh, research sites, one in, in Bangladesh Sundarbon in Ashashuni, another one is uh, Indian Sundarbon in Kumarmari. So this is like the, the project background, the, the, the larger project we are conducting uh, and that this finding is a part of this uh, larger project. And the methodology for this uh, specific study was uh, uh, 
ethnographic methodology we used. So what we have done so far, we have uh, selected 40 farmers who are involved heavily in agriculture, uh, vegetable productions, fish farmings uh, in our uh, research site. So uh, using uh, ethnographic, uh, like the, the classic ethnographic uh, methods, uh, participant observations, we're also uh, using uh, local, uh, so the, the lo we uh, in our research team, we have uh, local people involved. So there we're also like the emic approach is a, the classic uh, et ethnographic uh, model. We're also um, shadowing the farmers. We have selected 40 farmers. 23 of them are male and 17 of them are female. So our researchers have been um, working of shadowing those farmers, uh, observing their activities, uh, their agriculture practices, their cultural and social aspects. So this is the, the bundle of the uh, methodology we're using to collect information, to cross-check, triangulate our findings with everyday interaction with the research community and uh, the participants. And the, the research site, so I would give you a bit of uh, the background of our research site. So we are not calling it a research site, we are calling it our, our living labs. So the, the, the logic behind calling it uh, living labs is not, is like that we are going in the field, we are collecting data, we are coming back um, in cities to analyze the data. So the data we are collecting is being analyzed, is being discussed with the research participants at the research sites and those findings will uh, result in experimentation so we will uh, we are conducting research the finding based on the finding we will design an experimentation an experimental will also happen on the same site where we are conducting research now so these are uh, living labs so we have two uh, living labs one is Bangladesh um, Ashashuni and another is in Kumir uh, Mari in West Bengal so the, the, the area in Ashashuni, the, our uh, living lab site, the Pratapnagar Union, uh, this is one of the most climate vulnerable area union in Bangladesh uh, based on uh, the regional uh, vulner climate vulnerability index. Um, and this is a like the predominantly shrimp farming area. Most of the land used to, and is still there are a lot of uh, uh, saltwater shrimp farming uh, enclosure there. And it also like the, the climate change impacts is a very, uh, very common. And as you can see uh, the, the picture in the left side, you can see that the, these uh, areas used to be a shrimp enclosure, but after two, uh, 2020, 22, uh, this is that they're no longer uh, cultivating shrimp. Um, so that's one of our objective today uh, in this presentation, the why there is no longer in shrimp. Uh, so let's go to the, so the, the, the background, as I'm saying, so in 2020 Amphan, uh, the Amphan, like uh, the people, they used to, uh, to cyclones. They know how to deal with cyclones and everything. So through our research, we, we heard that repeatedly that we don't, we don't fear cyclone that much, uh, but we fear floods. So if uh, embankment bridges, if uh, slime water remain, uh, remain in our lands for a longer period of time, it destroys not only livelihood, but everything. So in 2020, the Amphan caused a huge destruction, uh, not from the cyclone itself, but, but from the, the flood that uh, that followed the cyclone. So the embankment breaches and the flood water remains around two years in that, the whole union. So as you can see the picture, the people, it's a Friday uh, Muslim uh, prayer uh, time. So people are standing um, like the, the, the deep water to pray. Uh, so all these pictures is uh, these are authentic pictures from the locality. Uh, so this is the, the the context the context we are uh, doing our research. So um, after 2020, uh, 20, uh, the shrimp farming has become a political issue. Uh, one of the reason was so when the amendment bills in 2020, then. Um, the, 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 the shrimp farmers and the local government, they are not very willing to fix the embankment uh, because as long as there is a flow of saline water is good for shrimp farming. So, and it created a two group of people, uh, one group of people that are interested in shrimp farming, another group of people that are interested 
uh, not to do shrimp farming. So shrimp farming and the subsequent livelihood, it became a huge political issue, especially for 22 local election. So the, 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 the sitting chairman there, then sitting chairman, he was very pro shrimp farming. And, and that's why the, the area remained, um, most of the area, part of the area was uh, remained flooded because it was uh, beneficial for shrimp farming. And uh, the opposition, the, the campaign based on uh, agriculture and shrimp farming ban. And uh, during 22 election, the, the, the person who campaigned uh, against shrimp farming, he, uh, he elected uh, with a sizable margin and he immediately banned shrimp farming. So he, uh, he said that in, in one of our interviews said that he is not against shrimp farming, but more of his uh, against using uh, cultivable land for shrimp farming, and uh, he want to uh, he want to get back to the previous estates uh, before floods. So the flood destroys a lot of trees. It destroys lots of agricultural lands, and so he want to reverse that. And that's one of the reason he banned shrimp farming. So after banning the shrimp farming, the impact uh, what we documented through our observation through our ethnographic study that's uh, that's a multi layer impact. So it, it, it not only impacting the livelihood of the local people, livelihood of the farmers, also impacting uh, the water issues, is also impacting the gender roles within the community, it also impacting um, the livelihood, of course, of the, but it, various aspects of livelihood, not livelihood as a single unit, but uh, livelihood, the aspects of livelihood, the layers of livelihood. As we go forward, we can see how it impacting uh, the overall. So the the, the one of the, the argument, uh, the pro agriculture farmer uh, made is a very frequent. We heard it from every farmer we uh, interviewed, we discussed that their point of view is the stream is profitable for only a limited number of people. But with agriculture, uh, the it, it, it employs a lot of people. So not only the farmers doing the agriculture, it employs uh, agriculture labor, it provides support uh, for um, crop sharing farmers, farmer can lease lands and do agriculture, farmer can, uh, uh, like the borga charge, it's like, yeah, the land is someone else's, you, you, you cultivate, you share the crops. So, and, and also, this is also very uh, relevant for their food security, as they are saying that they are growing rice, they are growing vegetable and fish, and this directly contributing to their food security since they don't need to depend on market to buy essential food items. So how it impacting, how the shrimp banning impacting rice production? So the many farmers, we, we have seen, uh, all of the farmers, the 40 of them, they all are doing agriculture and some kind of uh, rice cultivations. And there are farmers who is doing rice in the in, in uh, the first time for the last 30 years. So the last 30 years, the land were used for shrimp farming. Now the farmers are trying to agriculture uh, growing rice. So one of the aspects is since this land, land has been under saline water for so long, so the farmer are experimenting different, uh, different kind of uh, rice varieties. So one of the rice varieties is called uh, Takshel is a local rice varieties. The farmer reported that their grandparents used to grow that uh, variety, but it, it kind of uh, lost its way, but now they are reinventing it. Uh, so that variety has a very strong salt, um, how would I say, it's a, a salt uh, resilient variety. So it, it can grow if the, if the even if the land is a bit uh, salty, and also the Union Council is actively providing uh, pesticides and fertilizer to promote more agriculture. So it's, it's a it's a win-win for the Union Council and the farmer. The Union Council want more agriculture and the farmer also wants to grow uh, rice. So the Union Council is uh, proactively providing seeds and fertilizers and other supports. So we also have seen a, a cascading effect on vegetable um, aspects in, in our study area that all the farmers, all the farmers we are uh, working with, they are growing vegetables and 
and the women are heavily involved. So most of the vegetable garden are taken care of by the women. Uh, so they are the one who is uh, doing the land preparation, who is doing the cultivation, who is uh, taking care of the, the, the vegetable gardens. So one of the interesting aspects of the vegetables is that the land size is very small, but they are producing a lot of different varieties. So this is like the, the huge diversification of um, the, the, the vegetable cultivation. So when we ask why a uh, lot of different varieties, so the response that there are that the different different responses the, the most frequent response was uh, uh, since the land was um, saline before we don't know which vegetable will grow and which will not so we are kind of experimenting uh, in the last uh, two years uh, since 2022 they are experimenting the which vegetable actually has the potential to grow more and then through this experimentation through this very local uh, very indigenous experimentation they are actually trying to see the which vegetable has the most potential to cultivate in a larger scales we are also seeing that the fresh farming has um, is increasing uh, freshwater fish farming has increasing um, has been increasing and the farmer are combining rice vegetable and fish so it's a kind of, they have a land, uh, so they dig a small ponds on the one side, they store rainwaters there, they use those rainwaters for uh, agriculture, vegetables, and also for uh, rice productions, but also they, they produce fish in this place. So it's a very, uh, very self-sufficient uh, symbiosis uh, relationships, uh, vegetable, fish, and uh, rice. So it's all supporting each other and uh, the farmer are benefiting from it. So overall um, aspects, so uh, I would like to request all of you to pay attention on the pictures because all those pictures are taken from our field as a part of our ethnographic uh, methods to uh, visually document uh, what's going on. So all those uh, photos are, are actual and we, our research team has collected those photos. So, so through the photos, you can also get a sense that, that in this picture, you can see there is a rice and there is a, a, the water body, that there are fish in the water. We, I can show you the fish, <laughs> but uh, there is also vegetables in other side of this. So they're maximizing the land use while producing uh, the different sort of um, products they need for daily lives. So the overall impact, uh, so I'm, I'm using the word impacts here, but uh, we still need to dig deeper so to see the, uh, the longer impact of the shrimp banning. It happened in 2022. We're talking in the, the beginning of 2024. So it's not, it's like that one and a half year. So based on the responses, based on, on the farmers, so the, the, the ban on shrimp is actually impacting the food security positively. So now they have their own rice to eat, they have their ponds to fish, they have they are growing vegetables for their own consumptions and also for uh, market. So they're also saying that the, since the salt water is out of the equation now, so they, the drain water actually is improving the soil, soil health, it's also restoring the ecosystem service. The pollinator has increased um, their uh, dependency on the forest. So this the place is very adjacent to Sundarbun. That's why the living site of our uh, English for Sundarbun project. So their dependency on the forest also reduced. Now they're busy with agriculture. And um, so the, the next steps are of, of our research that we would like to uh, critically assess whether these overall changes in livelihoods and agricultural practices can be termed as agroecological practices, can be termed these as a integrated farming. We're seeing farmer combining uh, vegetables, rice, and fish in one a small parcel of land. So can it be an integrated farming approach? And also the, all these changes, it happened at the very local level. So local government uh, decide to ban shrimp farming and its impacts and results in increased agricultural activities, increased agroecological activities. So uh, this is very locally led adaptation. So we, the, the next phase of our research is to critically assess whether these changes can be termed as local adaptation or can it be uh, as a 
to fulfill the can it be fulfilled the uh, the principles of nature based solution so we know that the iucn has a of the like eight principles for nature based solution so what we have been documenting in the field and what have been uh, discussed at the theory level policy level so next step of our research is to combine those uh, the, the field level uh, data with the uh, theories with the 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 principles we have to see if we can term these as a locally led natural based solution approach that actually support and one of the important aspects so that uh, the governance is obviously a very important aspect for uh, adapt climate adaptations um, all this natural based solutions and aspects but this can this be this model this what happened in putab nagar can this be a model or in case for further exploration or for uh, scaling up for other areas as well. So this is very uh, localized governance system, very place-based, very context specific. So the, the there was a problem, um, shrimp farming has been going on and the farmer complaining about it. And then there is a, a kind of a tipping point, the floods, it remained for two years and it, it, it it uh, create a condition, a socio uh, economic, socio political conditions. Then actually, that actually result in banning the shrimp farm. So this is not a, like the one time thing. Said that there is a lot of causations and uh, the causal relationships. There is a there is a reaction and action, action and reaction. So we through this uh, our ongoing research, we are documenting all those aspects. So, so far, this is our the findings of, that we are exploring how local governance system can actually influence and impact the livelihoods and how those livelihoods can be sustainable and resilient. Okay, um, end of Thank my- Thank you, Dr. Bhai, yes. uh, for that okay. insightful presentation on resilient livelihood in the Bangladesh in the bonds. So as we have just shared, the challenges and opportunities facing this critical region are vast and multifaced. Now let's shift our focus to the Indian Shundarbans. While Bangladesh and India uh, shared a single uh, Shundarbans uh, ecosystem, the dynamics within each country's portion are influenced by various factors, such as climate change, disaster, anthropogenic activities, and different governance system. Uh, so understanding these distinct uh, aspects is essential for ensuring resilient livelihood. To shed light on the scenario in the Shundarbon, like Indian Shundarbans, I am delighted to invite Shorodeep to share the case study on governance influence for um, building resilient communities in the Indian part of Shundarbans. Uh, Shorodeep's research and insights will provide us uh, with valuable perspective on the challenges and opportunities unique to the Indian side of the Shundarbans. But in the meantime, I encourage all of you to actively participate by writing your questions in the chat box. We will address them uh, during our dedicated question answer session following the presentation. So without further ado, Shorodip, the floor is yours. Uh, your mic, yeah. Thank you. thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Biplav Bhai, for such a nice presentation. And also, uh, hello, everyone. Um, afternoon greetings from humid Kharagpur. Now I'm sharing my screen. Is it visible now? Hello? Yeah. OK, fine. So uh, we are, uh, as we are all aware of the thing that we are now uh, in a journey of developing camaraderie between both the parts of Bengal in a transboundary project uh, which about which you have an in initial introduction from both of our eminent speakers and presenters. So now I will be presenting the journey or the case study from the Indian sites of Sundarbans. Uh, this is Kumirmari, a small island village from the Goshaba block, district of South 24 Parganas, Shundarbans. So as part of the central theme of today's discussion, governance influence for building resilience, uh, resilient community. So here we have uh, hypothesized our work in such a manner uh, to assess uh, the way of communication between governance uh, 
as a structure, process, or mechanism, or attributes of governance with the process of building resilience, how they are mutually interact with each, each other, how they are shaping or reshaping through our methods and methodologies involved in our work. So our work is principally navigated through the methodologies, three principal methodologies. First, the archival methodologies, archival research, and accessing all the secondary sources. Second one, our ethnographic engagement with the field area through deploying the conventional ethnographic qualitative methods like key informant interviews, focus, focus group discussion, informal interactions, or kind of immersive adda, what we call in Bengali, participant observations, uh, transit works, field diary, et cetera, et cetera. Also, we have applied knowledge co-production through involving multiple stakeholders related to the scenario of our study area. And we have applied uh, a few methodological approaches like use of SWOT, discourse analysis, and also a tangible output, uh, which I will discuss later, a practice-based training module in inland fisheries in form of design and dissemination, how that could be also uh, in action towards fostering uh, kind of social resilience uh, under the ages of government, governance. So this is our study area, uh, Kumirimari. This is from the Indian Sundarban parts. This is Gosaba block, one of the most remotest and vulnerable blocks sharing boundaries, both internationally with Bangladesh Sundarban's part, also sharing bordered by the rivers with the Sundarban core forest, reserve forest area, what is known as Sundarban Tigers Reserve since 1972. And here lies our uh, small village island, Kumirmari, like a notch on the north eastern corner of this Gosaba block. Uh, and the very uniqueness of this island is this is the one moja, one island, and one village panchayat. And uh, this is the remotest part uh, of Bengal, where uh, sometimes govern, sometimes the mode of governance uh, gets delayed to reach their people. This is the fallacy. So the first methodological intervention we had that archival method to assess the interaction between the governance and our study area of Sundarbans. So what we have found from our archival research and secondary sources that the colonial intervention took place in Sundarbans as a watershed because like all other color colonies, colonizers also grabbed that area from the core part of view of revenue generation. And that is why they have to reclaim the virgin tract of impenetrable forests, thus to convert them to high uh, crop yielding agricultural land, thus they can gain revenues. Through bits and pieces of this reclamation venture, they encountered risks. So e each of the risks shaped their perception of these landscapes and gradually their reclamation venture is uh, simultaneously getting shaped by those risk scenario and how they those risks were posing hindrance before their ventures and that further reflected in their formulation of colonial policies here are some of the snippets about the uh, uh, one of the uh, most dominant risks, like the risks of wilderness, the risks of uh, recurrent cyclones, and uh, that led them to think of the, uh, uh, that led them to think of the extent of their revenue and reclamation regime, and also regarding their inter regarding their desirable interventions. So. As a result, what we have found, they are, while they tried to tame the very fluidity of this region, they came up with uh, the oriental expansion of the westernized modern technological interventions. We encountered concrete embankment in Sundarbans, created 
a fixed boundary between the between the eternal exchange eternal flow uh, between solid between the solid space and the liquid space also we have found the scientific the idea of scientific forestry and as a result of as a result of that the fortress conservation regime came in the later period and sundarbans gradually enti entitled as a conservation as a conservation place and as a conservative as a conserved natural park so all of these things were guided by their colonial calculus of rules from the core uh, calculation of profit generation from these colonies and towards assessing all those things they have overlooked or somehow skipped the entangled nature of these innate risks attributes of this region also as a part of this rather paying fragmented attention to each of the distinct risks what they have what they have done in the as a result we have found the further escalation or reproduction of risks which has been practiced continued and perpetuated under the ages of community practice different agencies government power relations and thus identified the region as a risk area again when we encountered contemporarily the study area just after the amphan the scenario was like this the area was uh, jointly hit by the severe cyclone amphan as well as covid is already there so as a result the area was gifted with increased and enhanced salination to their land and water bodies with breached embankments moreover people those who have migrated after the previous severe cyclone as an aftermath of the pre previous severe cyclone of isla they have to return as the nationwide lockdown triggered a suspension of all kind of economic activities so people naturally becoming bereft of all kind of livelihood resources livelihood generating opportunities they found an over reliance over the jungle and that ended up with the criminalization of this marginalized forest uh, fringe dwelling communities in the hand of fortress conservation regime the forest department officials or their life might be ended up in attack of tiger so in this predicament these are the existing set of the policy and governance at very by focusing on the various domains in tune with our study area from the fold of our national government all of these things more or less focusing on the conservation aspect conservation of natural resources people's empowerment people's participation people's access management in terms of natural resources also in the very recent ones there are Uh, rigorous holding on climate change and adaptation aspects also and these existing set of policies also underscores people's participation integration of local knowledge uh, people's voice local practices decision making etc but what we have found again we have to uh, have a recap to our first encounter with the field just after amphan sundarban becomes a contested landscape because to the governance in to the governance aspect still the governing institutions were considering the flood risk as a stand alone risk were considering human tiger attack as a stand alone risk were considering the problem of embankment breaching breaching as a uh, stand alone risk the area devoid of other livelihood generating opportunities like no uh, proper transportation mechanism proper industry so everything from the fold of government were addressed from a top down narrowed myopic vision of a distinct set of risk we need to assess it distinctly but these tracers 
were already entangled that sorry that identify the area as a basket of risks as a basket of risks and here the word bubbles came out of the uh, ground zero and at this time of multiple disruptive risks that were in that were awaiting uh, those set of risks were awaiting multiple disruptive resilience so what we found in individual level there were asset loss salinization in the agricultural lands they had to halt farming uh, so as a result over dependence on the jungle because the op option of migration is already closed due to the nationwide lockdown and all again escalating uncertainty vulnerability marginalization across the island but there were silver lines also there were some indigenous popular practices there were some indigenous knowledge base which has been practiced from the time immemorial and people are embracing this as an individual way of coping that was a part of individual level on institutional level this fragmented or myopic vision in dealing with risks despite having such a huge number of policy lines legislations laws regulations in india that further revealed the non participatory attributes of the government Gov the governance itself shows their incapacitance in terms of being polycentric multi layered in this context of sundarbans and showing offering less accountability less deliberative nature of governance which got reflected in the post disaster scenario peeping people lagging access to franchise people people lagging access to political good political nexus were largely being discriminated in terms of compensatory and aids and relief uh, related work related programs also also there were some scenarios like these uh, the all the relief programs as per the inter interlocutors or community use or respondents reflected that all the relief programs could not touch all the corners of these remotest islands umirmari is also one of this one of such islands so <laughs> finally those incapacitants in the fold of governance got evident in terms of the eternal relation between the governance or in terms of fostering adaptive resilience being fit to assess the threshold being fit to assess the uncertainty being fit to reorganize through absorbing the shock in a socio ecological system that got failed and the resilience somehow which had to be partially achieved but this time it got failed at the outfall of multiple disruptive risks as a result the shortcoming of single disaster approach leading to the differential and unjust distrib distribution of risks attributes of government governance always tells about the just justice and equitable distribution of involuntary risks aspect as well as the equitable distribution of capacity building and that also get evident from the field that the existing set of knowledge based skill set practiced practices and bottom up needs driven aspirations were largely overlooked and gradually getting cornered in the context of the remotest islands of india and sundarbans like kumirmari and that prompted in the post disaster period that prompted the that prompted to upscale the viability of this individual way of coping which was harnessed in that island also in terms of their indigenous practice indigenous knowledge base on inland fishing and inland fishing evolved as such a means that 
made the community to absorb or tackle the certain shocks in the post disaster era and that was and that was then awaiting to be co-produced through integrating all other technical know-hows all other infrastructural and technical supports from all the necessary stakeholders to extend it beyond the unviable unviable futures so here that prompted us to engage into the scenario through the method of knowledge co-production borrowing from the idea of knowledge co-production as uh, featured by nostrum at all we also try we also tried to foster a synergy between uh, through our rigorous scoping analysis and mapping of the scenario we tried to foster a synergy between the top down fragmented existing governmental approaches and policy frameworks in the one hand. on the other hand the existing skill set knowledge base knowledge bases uh, existing livelihood practices uh, already incumbent there as well as the needs driven bottom up community aspirations through the form of uh, through the form of a participatory engagement involving all the uh, relevant actors and all the stakeholders following the guiding principles of knowledge co-production to the context of the viability of a climate resilient inland fishing experimentation in terms of sundarbans through a pluralistic manner engaging local community scientific knowledge as well as government uh, inputs as well as infrastructural uh, integrations also towards a goal of design development of a practice based training module capturing the best pr practices and exist existing sets that could the community harness themselves to be uh, to enhance their capacity adaptability and on a larger sense to get transformed into the institutional approaches before the threats of such multiple disruptive risks and that session was also interactive allowing and envisioning the project and evolution of the whole trajectory through the involvement of multiple stakeholders that activated the agencies through awareness participation involvement and experiment throughout of this processual plurilog through trust building amongst different set of stakeholders there were community fishers there were local ngos there were parastatal bodies there were uh, go local government panchayat institutions there were uh, department from fishery department from forest or uh, department uh, experts from agriculture there are veteran fishers farmers as well as the academia throughout of these all the actors and scenarios are mapped and as well as the strength weakness opportunities and threats are <coughs> mapped on the basis of this an experimentation in inland fisheries an experimentation design has been co developed and finally that experimentation took place again there were challenges and their solution sometime came through uh, sometime came through technical in input sometime community their own uh, through their own set of local knowledge base tackled those challenges then collating all those best practices get transformed into a tangible output called practice based training module on inland fishing that inland fishing which has been embraced as a means for coping already by the local people to reduce the over dependence on the forest to reduce uh, the uh, uh, non existence of other livelihood opportunities to generate new place based livelihood solution in kumirmari that further facilitated the integration and implementation 
education to sciences through this and through out of this training module the areas of low vulnerability moderate vulnerability and higher vulnerability has been addressed awaiting small moderate and high degree of intervention and these are the responses coming out responses mechanisms came out of this entire journey in terms of coping adaptive and transformative three key capacities in terms of fostering social resilience so as a result <coughs> through this through this training model what has been based practiced what has been based practice yet in the face of disasters to tackle the immediacy now fostering people's way to draw lessons from the past thus they are capable enough to tackle the upcoming adversaries also these interactive participatory approaches uh, crafting plurilog amongst different stakeholders also integrating the local knowledge base as well as technical inputs and infrastructures upholds or underscores the necessity or involvement of interactive governance in this context of such an ecologically fragile region of sundarbans thus the skills or capacity known or learned in the form of adaptive aspects those could be upskilled into transformative capacities through the involvement of institutional approaches <coughs> that could promote the social resilience in the face of the future crisis so through our training module there are various nitty gritties and involvements uh, already have been tapped and we are already in the process of developing and also arranging the results in a manner thus we could evidently map uh, or validate the areas of interactions as well as cross scale dynamics amongst the aspects of capacity uh, aspects of three capacities of social resilience and well being also it is our findings through this training module that many of the sustainable development goals from reducing poverty to reducing hunger offering equitable scope for the inclusion of gender inclusion of people from different race class caste sex uh, caste political belief religious belief and also ensuring uh, um meaningful consumption as well as restoration of ecology ecosystem and also addressing the threats of climate resilience and everything is needed through the bond of knowledge sharing and knowledge exchange so this is how we we are also addressing the uh, development fr framework that that promotes the holistic development of a proper governance systems like uh, in, uh, in context minute. okay in context of uh, the ecological fragile regions like sundarbans so uh, that opens avenue for the frameworks like sendai informs and sdgs so uh, we are still in a process to validate and cross validate what we have found in tune uh, with our study area of kumirmari but what we can learn through our uh, engagement of knowledge co production guided by archival and ethnographic methods that it is a methodology uh, fostering participatory and interactive uh, essence that reduce the very gap between the existing set of governance and to the process of social resilience so that's all uh, from our end and thank you
Thank you, Shorudip, for that insightful presentation on governance influence for building resilient communities in the Indian part of Sundarbans. Your examination on the Indian uh, Sundarbans scenario provided like valuable insights into the complexities of governance and its impact on resilient livelihood efforts. Unfortunately, Dr. Samia A. Selim, who was scheduled to speak next, um, has had to leave the event unexpectedly due to family duties. We extend our like understanding and support uh, to her during this time. So now, without further delay, let's continue our discussion by delving deeper into the impact of climate change on livelihoods in the Sundarbans Delta. We are honored. Uh, we are honored to have um, Emily Kremin, project coordinator and researcher at the University of Lausanne, join us as our next key discussant. Emily's work in environmental geography and community resilience positions her as a leading voice in understanding the integrate dynamics of climate change impacts. Her research on the ongoing situation in the transboundary Sundarbans regions offers very, um, valuable insights into the challenges faced by the Delta communities. So now without delay, I invite Emily Kremen um, to share her perspective on the climate change impacts on livelihoods in the Sundarbans Delta, leading to sub subsistence livelihood, anthropogenic like influences and the ongoing situations in the transboundary region. Emily, floor is yours. Thank you, Mahona. It's a, a great honor to be here with you today. And I'm, uh, I found, yeah, the, Presentation from Surajit uh, Patak and Ruralist um, Diplop, um, very much um, showing all the situation of the both sides of the Delta. So um, we have a very clear and um, very in depth description and analysis of the condition of the Delta in both sides. Um, so I would like to show. Uh, like I try to make a small uh, synthesis uh, about uh, resilience of social ecological systems, and um, you can see here. Um, yeah, so I'd like also to have your contribution in the future. We can uh, brainstorm on this uh, figure, which is uh, inspired from uh, frequent Burks and Carlfall. It's a uh, quite an old figure. This uh, loop, this feedback loop, and uh, this resilience. Uh, of a, a transformative system loop. Um, it is inspired from uh, frequent based scaffold in the 2000s and uh, holding. And so we can um, analyze, integrate into the system many of uh, the discussion of the points you have uh, highlighted in, uh, in the previous discussion. And um, so the idea is to find what are the, the, the root cause of the disaster. So you, you already show it, it's very complex. And um, what are the capacities of the committees uh, with the support from the government uh, to be to, to create a resilient future for the uh, deltas, for the delta, which is uh, the GBM. Um, and so, yeah, you can see in this loop, first of all, uh, we had the initial uh, situation, which was a uh, transition like um, from the 60s, we can say it was already a, a main transition um, from the very much rural life uh, with uh, uh, less uh, pesticides, less uh, intensive agriculture, um, more extensive practices um, with the development and the demand from international uh, demand on rice, on shrimp. Um, there were committees were involved in the intensification of the agriculture. So it started first with the green revolution with the rice intensification in the 60s. Um, this has, this came uh, inequality in the territories, but it reached as well the suburban region. And more recently, we have the high demand on shrimp and seafood production. So this is also related to the international demand on food. Um, there is a big pressure on the communities. At the same time, some uh, people in the in the society are getting benefit from this rise in the demand, and they invest in the 
in the infrastructures uh, privately for free. Um, they also uh, the communities, and at the same time, um, there are, yeah the old system is changing because the indirectly uh, there is a increase in size of the uh, cropping area, which uh, also. Uh, destabilize the the whole uh, embankment infrastructure, or it's uh, strengthened. But with the same in, in opening of the street gates for shrimp, the salty water is uh, salinizing the soils and is increasing the aquaculture production. I am talking more here about Asashuni because uh, Kumir Mary is very much still protected from the salt water intrusion. Um, because it, the boulder has been uh, well, um, well kept for rice paddy cultivation in an intensive manner. Because now we can have two to three production of rice per year, which is already very much intensive. And um, so the Kumamara is more specialized in rice. But in Atashuni, we have seen the effect of the of the um, opening of the sluice gate for um, aquaculture intensification. And then a uh, further um, impact on the communities who get their land salted and they cannot do any more rice. So um, this is all a question of governance. Who decides what to do with this land, with the land, and uh, who manage uh, how communities are involved in the in the decision um, around the 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 production in their land, in their territory, in the in their subdivision uh, or their Upazila. Uh, um, so committee's uh, inclusion into the governance is, is still a big gap. The, and it's very much different between both deltas, uh, both sides of the border. Uh, this governance system is very much different in India and in Bangladesh. So um, yeah, we just didn't uh, explain in detail this graph. So um, here is more like, I'd like to put the date, so more 60s. Uh, we had the uh, polarization. Uh, we had still the ecosystem services uh, related to the mangrove area, uh, which could protect the, um, the land from the, the floods as a buffer. Uh, but uh, with the intensification of the production, it was also um, at the same time, between 60s and, and, and 2000, we had a high densification of the population with the population growth and the increase of aquaculture. Then uh, at the same time, we had the increased uses of pesticide and improved varieties, um, including improved varieties for rice or for shrimp. Um, then at the same time, increased disasters in the region with the embankment ditches which uh, led uh, to very big disaster for the communities in Asashuni, for example, where communities lost their livelihoods. And the communities had, some of the members of the community had also opportunities in the city, so they migrated out. So this makes also um, a change in demographics. And uh, we have at the same time a very big loss of biodiversity and degradation of the, of the forest, which was a buffer. For against the cyclones. So progressively, we have a decline in the capacities of the mangroves to absorb the disaster, the cyclones and storm surge. And so after the disaster, now we are in the process of thinking what will be the future. So there is a big planning in, in, the, in Bangladesh. You have the National Adaptation Plan, which is thinking how to adapt. And here we can. Our um, our discussion and our research and the participatory research with the community, um, will, we hope it can be integrated in our research can be integrated in this national adaptation plan and support communities uh, integration uh, and participation into the policies to support uh, agriculture agricultural practices that will not use so much pesticides and um, improve varieties which uh, degrade the biodiversity because this might not be sustainable for the future because we'll just uh, custom services. 
Um, so this would be a positive transformation if we can integrate communities, uh, agroecological practices. However, um, if this is not the case, um, that uh, still the idea is to intensify agriculture for exports, then uh, another way will go out of this shape and might go again into disaster. Um, so, yeah, it's, we hope that our research will be um, supportive of the communities uh, to support their agroecological knowledge. Um, so, next step was uh, just we'd like to hear is a black. When you were discussing, I was just thinking how we can compare both sides. Uh, India and um, and Bangladesh sites to compare the policies, uh, agricultural policies, um, and to say what what are the uh, present agricultural policies? How the government is supporting at, um, um, agriculture producers? Um, who is supported? Is it the big producers or the small producers? How much the small producers? Are supported for the for sustainable practices. Um, yeah, this is a global challenge. In every continent, we have the same issue that government has to decide how they will support some producers in a sustainable way or just for food security with with, with the risk to have uh, very much polluted soils and a degradation of the biodiversity. So, and at the same time, we have also policies for infrastructure, which is connected to agriculture. So what are the, um, which is the plan for the agro infrastructures, how embankments are built, what is the investment, um, what is the future vision of the, these deltas? Um, there are all the policy sectors we can also um, analyze. Um, then there is a question that we should not avoid to think about is the relations of power. Oops, sorry. The relation of power, which is also uh, very much affecting the communities locally. So, um, who is uh, influential and who is ruling the the land, uh, the communities, um, in the, in different Upazila, uh, who um, who decide of the the changes that will be made in the delta. Then, and next uh, question to be compared in both uh, areas is what are the community's capacities and uh, social constraints to support uh, agroecological practices, sustainable agroecological practices. And uh, yeah, okay, so this is just open questions. Um, thank you very much. I hope uh, we can answer this question in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Emily, for your and um, like illuminating insights into the resilience of socio-ecological system in the Shundarbans Delta. Your comprehensive analysis has like depended our understanding on the of the challenges faced by Delta communities and the urgent needs of resilient building strategies. Now I would like to open the floor for question and answer. I encourage all our participants to share their thoughts, insights, and questions in the chat box. Uh, whether you have like queries for our speakers or wish to contribute to the conversation, this is the opportunity uh, for you to engage our estimated speakers. So let's make the most of this like interactive session by fostering meaningfully dialogue and exchanging ideas. So please feel free to type your questions and we will discuss them um, as proceed. But I, I can see like there is one question by Nafis, which is like, can we get the reference of this picture? And I think this question was, was for Shorodip and Shorodip has already provided the answer in the chat box. But Shorodip, do you wanna talk about it? Yeah, I've already addressed. It's available uh, in the Survey of India Library also, as well as University of Michigan. First ever mapping of Bengal Delta by James Rennell, 1776. Okay, uh, all of the maps are available online. Okay, thank okay. you. Great. There was another question, which is like, are there any available options of obtaining the PowerPoint presentation? So, 
we will share the presentation with all the participants through an email like right after the session end and also i think um the video recording of the session will be shared through ecats govishana um youtube yeah, channel yes sir paul and if you want we can share the video okay perfect um abrar as we are like uh, at the end of our session can we open the floor for everyone so that like the participants can directly open their mic and ask the question Thank you. Thank you. sorry Abu, uh, this is on webinar mode so you will be able to ah. raise your hands and write on the chat for the question and sessions okay so we can do that like later so um participants who want to like share their thoughts or questions directly, they can just raise their hand, then we can allow them to share their thoughts directly. I can see there is a question from Rene. So, um, Abra, can you please uh, invite Rene to share his question directly? Okay. Yeah, sure. So, Rene, is, I think now you can. Great. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. Thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, the presentation. It was really, really great. Uh, just a quick uh, a question to uh, Beeplop. Uh, uh, really interesting that the local government can make a, 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 a difference. Uh, however, I was just wondering, uh, given the power, power relations, relations. Uh, wow. between local governments and the shrimp business community, how was it possible for the local government to enforce the ban on shrimp farming? And what was then the reaction of the business community to this ban? Um, thank you, Renee. It's very nice to see you here. Um, so there are like, uh, as I said in the presentation, so there are multiple layers of the ban. So the first, uh, it was a demand within the community. So before the election, um, there was ongoing talk uh, about, uh, so one uh, candidate who campaigned based on a pro shrimp agenda and another campaign a candidate campaign based on like entry shame agenda. So there was a uh, social condition, there was a political condition that actually allowed to discuss banning the shame. So that's the first part. And that when the, the entry shame candidate win the election, so he got the backing of the people, of the community. So and, and now he has the office. So that's the, the, that's the one part. So another part, I, I pose the same question to the chairman, the how you manage to uh, do that. Uh, so he also said that the so when he started that uh, the banning, it, it, it came as a very organic way. He, he talked to people, he convinced people not to do that. So one, once he has a one example, he would show that example to others to follow the same uh, procedure. So this was one of the, the third suspect. What is uh, more interesting that after several months of banning the uh, the shrimp, the local agriculture department come in and they are actually asking people not to do any more shrimp. So the agricultural department, they are also uh, seeing the result of uh, the not doing shrimp. They start promoting. So it has a, a, a it's a very like a snowball effect of all the different. Um, entities involved in agriculture and livelihood sector. So local government was proactive from the beginning, then the uh, agriculture department involved, the community was involved from the beginning. And on top of these issues, uh, the, 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 the brother of the chairman, he uh, is a sitting a secretary of the central government of Bangladesh. So he has that kind of uh, family backup within the family um, that actually shake off any kind of like, uh, under the table pressure because his brother is a uh, sitting secretary so there's a multiple uh, multiple uh, factors that plays uh, and um, resulted in um, 
the the banning of uh, shrimp and it well accepted by the community but um you pointed out it very correctly that we also need to um so from our uh, the participant research participant there are there are farmer who used to do shrimp in the past uh, before the banning of the shrimp now they shifted to agriculture but they are not very big uh, like a stream businessman uh, or corporate business people but we will uh, so this is one of the point thank you for pointing out we will discuss with uh, we will interview some of the business people who uh, take the heat of the stream banning thank you so i can I can see that like Zabir Hussain has raised his hand. So I'm allowing, oh, so he can ask question directly. So Zabir Hussain, uh, please unmute yourself and share your question. Yeah. Hi everyone, uh, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear can me? You, uh, we can hear you, unfortunately. Hello? No. Yeah, Hello. we can hear you. You can hear us? Yeah. Hello. No, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for this uh, wonderful session. My name is Jabber, and I'm, I am now currently working in EC Mod at Nepal. So I have two questions. One is, um, I don't know if this is um, related to this webinar or not, uh, but um, one is, uh, what kind of policy recommendations uh, would you suggest uh, for governments and other organizations to better address uh, challenges that was um, posed by climate change in Shundavan Delta? That is one. And number two, uh, what role can international corporations and uh, partnerships play in supporting uh, resilience building efforts in vulnerable regions uh, like Shundavan or, uh, or any other deltas kind of thing? Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, what I can understand, like you, you have two questions. One is for like what sorts of policy interventions is needed there. And what another one is like what kind of collaboration is possible. So I think it's not a specific question for anyone. So anyone from our speakers, maybe Shorodeep or Diplo Bhai or Emily uh, can come here to uh, answer these two questions. So. Who wants to go first? So, people, you can go first. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I can respond. Uh, I don't have a definite um, answer, but uh, for the policy aspects, uh, um, my response would be like, uh, to in how do we involve community people and how do we empower local governance uh, to take more stakes at the decision making level? So, uh, for example, uh, the embankment is very important in, in, in the coastal area. If embankment breaches, it, it floods uh, the sal saline water everywhere into the uh, uh, agricultural land, into the village. But uh, embankment is managed, especially uh, in Bangladesh, I'm not sure how it managed in India, but in Bangladesh, yes, embankment is entirely managed by a central organization. So local government and community, they don't have any say any stakes at uh, any level of the embankment management. So when there is a, and like there's an embankment is in um, sorry state, so it could break anytime. The community people, the local government, they are the first uh, people who notice that, who could do something about that, but they're not allowed to. So they have to rely on, they have to send the masses back to the, the central government and the, the most of the cases, when the, the, the central government representative uh, came down, come down to that point, it's already broken. So one of the policy aspect could be the how do we um, involve local government uh, in decision-making process in a more rigorous way, mm -hmm. not just to like to show some uh, that we have representative for local government, but we need that actual uh, decision-making power actually actual power to do to uh, to implement things that they feel is uh, uh, needed so that's like the policy aspects and and the collaboration yes uh, obviously collaboration is uh, very important um, so one of the aspects of collaboration 
So the way uh, we are seeing more and more transdisciplinary resources, one of the aspects is to the research has to be designed, actively managed, actively conducted with the community. So that's the one of the core principle of transdisciplinary. It's not only the researcher or the like the academicians or uh, the experts, they do the research. So to do that, to do transboundary research, we need collaboration. Otherwise, it, it cannot be a uh, transdisciplinary research. So, so that's like, that's a very uh, simple explanation, but I think it's a important one. So to do collaboration, there's, you need uh, direct involvement of the people you are working for. So now we have to say like working with, not for anymore. So that's the one aspect of collaboration. Thank you. Um, thank you, Vipla Bhai. But uh, now I would like to request Shorodeep also share some thoughts about like recommendation on policies and collaboration. Like we would really love to hear about Indian part of Shundarban's site. And also there was another question from Jabir, um, which is who are the business people? So Shorodeep, if you can like address this question as well. And there is another question from Rene for you, which is uh, regarding the single risk approach of the government. So I would like to request you to cover all this um, question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for your invaluable comments and questions and glad to find Rene's response uh, as always, <laughs> he's with us. So first of all, uh, the thing uh, Diplav Bhai just addressed in terms of both the Sundarvans, what we are encountering, there are pretty lot of policies. I think uh, policies are there in both the part of the borders. But um, uh, the major discord is uh, what I have tried to capture uh, through my presentation and through our work from our Sundarvans part also. Th these policies are, um, are majorly uh drawn or formulated from a core top-down approach and that lags majorly in terms of integrating the community voice community knowledge base community skill set of practices community uh, learning and their own way of coping day-to-day -day coping and day-to-day -day learnings takeaways that is getting integrated in their constant journey or perpetuating journey with multiple disruptive risks. Risk is not a single thing here for case of Sundar ones. The risks are entangled, enmeshed. If we can categorize, for example, the risks of wilderness, uh, a stringent form of conservation regime where uh, that largely debarred the access management of the forest fringe dwellers, the indigenous people, especially in India who were entitled to co-inhabit co or coexist with forest since time immemorial. It is the Britishers, it is the colonial calculus of rule, it is the scientific forestry that excluded, that made an exclusionary approach of the indigenous people. And there is a policy change. Now in our country, forest rights acts came, joint forest management came, and that made a direct apology to the indigenous people of India uh, and returning their rights to cohabit or coexist with forest. That is in legal uh, aspects only. That is guaranteed only in the legal forms only. But in reality, in Sundar ones, for, for take examples for our Indian part of Sundar ones. Rene was just asking me about the single approaches in terms of dealings with disaster. Yeah, we had talked to the B local BDO, local panchayat, uh, uh, lo uh, panchayat samiti or gram panchayat, the lowest stratum of the rural administrative schema of India. Uh, Jila Parishad panchayat samiti and the lower one is uh, the gram panchayat. So what we have found, there is a lack of coordination and discord between the Department of Forest, Department of Fishery. Always they are in confrontation. Always in terms of Sundarban. For example, people uh, 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 trespassing into the forest because they don't have, uh, more, many of them are not having passes because the pass, passes are not functional, operational, new passes are not being issued in Indian part of Sundarbans. Also, the lease or hiring charges are very high. So it's quite impossible for the poor uh, forest fishers to afford a pass for a fishing season that costs uh, around 50,000 per annum for a particular fishing season. So once they are caught, once they are caught, 
Uh, so there is a conflict between conflict a conflictious moment between the forest department and the fisheries department. More often, they are criminalized, and in many of the cases, gram panchayat has to play the role of mediator. Even in case of tiger victims, also, even the dead bodies are being uh, masqueraded uh, through the extra legal ways due to such BLC pass and all. And when any disaster kind of things are happened, uh, for example, uh, while Amphan was happening, the sole uh, focus on, on behalf of the government was on how to tackle Amphan at the BDO level, uh, then at Panchayat level. But in India, uh, there is also you know, one unfortunate thing in Bengal, there is continuous a disharmony between the center and the state. Because we had a very good policy uh, secured uh, policy guarantee after ILA, there was a provision of ILA bond. But that time, the same uh, one of uh, some political parties didn't allow the central uh, government to declare the ILA as the national disaster, just because of the opposition parties who were ruling in West Bengal uh, during that time. Even even that scheme of ILA bond till date. Uh, through our ethnographic interventions with the various communities from Sundarbans, it is uh, it has been revealed that till that Ailaban was the most holistic, most almost holistic feasible solution up to the embankment situations in Sundarbans. There were various layers: one layer for mangroves, one layer for ringba and roads, uh, different kind of layers to protect the kind of habitations as per their localities, from the habitations close to the river habitations from the middle of the island, center of the island, these schemes were there in the island. But that uh, scheme also got repealed due to this political disharmony and incongruencies around these multi-layered and polycentric modes of governance. This is one of the major uh, hindrance in India, first of all. And secondly, uh, again, this coordination. For example, uh, irrigation and waterways department are in charge of embankment. This is one of the major operational department in Sundarban in terms of embankment. That is one of the key driver of fostering livelihood guarantee of people. Second, conservation regime that falls on the forest department. Third, a huge number of people uh, are involved with fishery that falls on the fishery department and in central uh, that is uh, taken care of by the agricultural department. So there is continuous disarmament and above all, all the approaches since the time of colonial design, they just following the technological... you to make it short so that okay. like others people can also okay, okay, okay. Uh, ask questions. Interventions and also they are hardly tapping the local community voice. This is the major lagging in terms of integrating the local knowledge set and skill practices. These are the things. Thank you. Thank you so much. So. Uh, is there any more question from any other participants? If yes, please raise your hand. We will take just one more question if there is any. Uh, so I can't see any hand raising. So I'm assuming like there is no question. So that's good. It was really wonderful like discussion. Uh, so, dear participant, we have reached the conclusion of our insightful, insightful uh, session on building resilience, uh, climate change impact and governance in the Sundarbans Delta. I hope you found the discussions enriching and thoughtful provoking. Um, before we end the session, I would like to invite Emily to share her closing remarks. So, Emily, please, um, the floor is yours for the closing remarks. Yeah, so thank you very much, Tessera Deep and Deep Love, Mamuda, Samia, uh, Rene, and uh, everyone uh, for attending the session. And uh, please continue to follow us on our website, so Engage for Sundarban, and on the, join our Facebook page as a friend. And uh, we are happy to keep in touch with everyone and follow the debate discussion and develop sustainable policy for the future. Um, support local communities uh, to to make their future better in the in the Delta. Thank you. 
Thank you. Now I would like to request everyone to turn on their camera so that we can like take a photo. So all the speakers and uh, key discuss and also Abrar, please turn on your camera so that we can take the photo. Let's take the photo. Um, so Poga from the part, please. Yeah. Ah, thank you very much. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so let's end the session here today. Abrar, I hope I will get all the like recording and. Um, oh, I